Good evening. Uh, welcome to Bible study. We are uh, entering the book of Acts this evening. We've completed our survey on the gospel. And uh, the book of Acts, of course, serves as an integral link in the New Testament. It was originally written as a complement to Luke's gospel. Uh, and it picks up the story where that gospel leaves off. Uh, in, in effect, uh, initially, it was like a two-volume work. Uh, let me just call your attention here. Let's open to Luke chapter 1 and verse 1. Luke 1, 1, For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us, even as they received them unto us, as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word, it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto you in order, most excellent Theophilus. You might know the certainty of those things wherein you've been instructed. So this is the purpose of the book of Luke, stated right here. It was uh, dedicated uh, to uh, a man by the name of Theophilus, written uh, specifically to him and then published for the church in general. Now, when we look at the book of Acts, it starts out, Acts 1.1, 1, 1, The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach, until the day in which he was taken up, after that he through the Holy Spirit had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And then it describes the actual ascension of Jesus Christ into heaven, uh, the disciples' return from the Mount of Olives. So the, book of, the books of Luke and Acts were both written by Luke. They were uh, like a two-volume set. One focused on the things that Jesus himself personally did and taught uh, during the years of his earthly ministry. Uh, The book of Acts is that. It is the act of the apostles, the things that they did. It picks up the story as the apostles gathered to watch Jesus ascend into heaven. And you can imagine what a remarkable event that must have been. Um, He appeared to them 40 days after his resurrection, which would take us just up within 10 days of the day of Pentecost. And uh, uh, it's interesting, as you find certain numbers run through in a significant fashion. At the beginning of the Old Covenant, uh, Moses was uh, gone up from the uh, Israelites for 40 days in the presence of God. After the day of Pentecost, uh, Jesus appeared and was with the apostles on various occasions. He was not with them completely or was not just... Uh, with them in a consecutive manner, but he appeared to them on on certain occasions to teach them and to instruct them uh, And uh, uh, during this time. It's interesting that he spoke of things pertaining to the kingdom of God. That was the beginning of his gospel message. Uh, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, we're told. Uh, During the 40 days, After his resurrection, he talked about the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. You go all the way through the book of Acts, and you end up uh, the very last chapter, the last few verses. Paul dwelt two whole years in his own house, receiving all that came into him, teaching them what? About the kingdom of God. You know, that is the message that runs through. (coughs) From time to time, people come up with these ideas, and of course, the uh, many, uh, particularly mainline Protestants, their idea is, well, the kingdom of God is something that is set up in the hearts of men everywhere. And they will take a particular verse uh, out of its context, uh, a verse that's translated in the King James, the kingdom of God is within you, when uh, more properly uh, it is the kingdom of God is among you, and that uh, the Greek word technically could be translated either way, but the context and everything makes plain that Christ was not saying that the kingdom of God had been set up inside of the Pharisees uh, because that's who he was talking to. But I think the clearest indication of, of what Christ meant is that the disciples, the twelve, the ones who had been there, who had been eyewitnesses to his ministry, who had heard his words with their own ears, 
they never got the idea from anything Jesus said about the kingdom of God that it was something that was set up in people's hearts. You know, they heard him say those things. They didn't have to read it uh, or read it in translation and all of that. They heard him say it. They asked questions. Their question in Acts 1, one of the last questions they asked him was, Lord, verse 6, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? They understood he was talking about a literal kingdom, the kingdom that was prophesied in the pages of the Old Testament. And their question was simply, is it time yet? And he did not tell them, oh, no, you've misunderstood everything I've told you about the kingdom of God. It's not what, what he said at all. After, he, after his resurrection, he talked to them about things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Acts 1, verse 3. So Christ had clearly not conveyed the message at all to his disciples if they still didn't understand it. No, he told them that it was not for them to know the times or the seasons that the Father had put in his own power. Christ did not answer their question of exactly when. Well, the book of Acts shows the continuity of the ministry of Jesus Christ through the work and the ministry of the early church. Uh, in that sense, Acts is a continuation of the Gospel of Luke. Um, he, of course, began with his focus on the ascension of Christ from the Mount of Olives and the role of the Twelve Apostles uh, in Jerusalem. Uh, very quickly, the narrative narrows its focus. If you go on through the first 12 chapters, you'll find that the focus is mostly on Peter and John. Beginning in verse 13, or not in, ver in chapter 13, the focus switches to the Apostle Paul. <coughs> the, uh, the others are only mentioned uh, just in passing. Uh, very little detail is given of any of the early, uh, original apostles except for, for Peter and John there in the early chapters. Uh, then once Paul appears on the scene, uh, there's very little mention made of Peter and John for the rest of the book. Uh, James, the brother of Jesus, appears off and on throughout the book. Now, why? Let's just pose a question. Why does the book of Acts cease to focus on the twelve, the twelve apostles, after Acts 12, which would be uh, approximately 44 A.D.? Why does it cease to talk about the twelve and concentrate on Paul from there on out? Uh, I, I think there are probably several reasons. One is that, that I don't, I've never seen any of the commentaries uh, that have understood this. But what was Christ's commission to the twelve? He told them to go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That was their commission. And only peripherally or incidentally did they go to others. The twelve had as their primary commission going to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. <clears throat> While God has preserved knowledge of the house of Israel and where they went, uh, he nevertheless allowed them to be lost from view in terms of the world as a whole. Uh, if all of the details of where all the places Peter went and, and uh, John went and Thomas went and, and uh, uh, you, you know, the various ones, if all of that was uh, recorded in detail, uh, then it would be pretty clear as to where the twelve went. Um, there are secular records, there, there are stories, there are traditions, but there's not uh, just real clear uh, detailed evidence preserved in, in Scripture. Paul, on the other hand, went primarily uh, to the Gentiles. That was a major part of his ministry. Uh, also, by focusing on Paul, we have the background provided for Paul's epistle. Uh, Paul was used of God to write the, uh, well, the closest thing to, quote, systematic theology, in quote, that exists in, in the New Testament. Uh, Paul gave detailed expositions of uh, 
many doctrines in a, in a, uh, a little different way than any of the other apostles were used to do. Um, Paul's 14 books provide a great deal of vital doctrinal and Christian living information. The book of Acts uh, goes with that. It enables us to view Paul's epistles in perspective, to understand a little bit of the background uh, of the cities to which he wrote, of uh, the background of his ministry there and what he encountered. Uh, you know, if you read a book and you don't understand any of the circumstances that prompted the book, then you're obviously uh, limited in what you're going to uh, understand from it. Um, you know, the book of Acts also makes it plain uh, how the gospel came to Rome and uh, certainly negates later Catholic claims. Um, you know, there's no indication when the book of Acts tells of, of Paul coming there, no mention of Peter. If Peter was there, if he was the Pope, uh, sort of hard to imagine uh, Paul being brought to Rome and no mention. You know, when he came, every time he came to Jerusalem, it always talked about him going up to salute James, who was the presiding apostle there in, in Jerusalem during those years. He went to Jerusalem. First thing he did was he went up to, to salute James. If he got to Rome, uh, at least you'd think there would be some mention of the Pope. Well, of course, there wasn't a Pope. Uh, Peter wasn't a Pope, and he wasn't there. You know, it's interesting. If you go back to the epistles of Peter, uh, Peter says that he was writing from Babylon. It's the only time the Catholics will tell you that Rome is Babylon uh, because they uh, the only way they can get Rome out of it. Peter was exactly where he said he was. He was in Babylon, which was uh, he, he was in the uh, uh, chief city of the uh, of the Parthian Empire, uh, which lay to the east of Rome. Uh, had both a jar large Jewish population as well as uh, there was uh, a number of the uh, tribes of Israel that were in Parthia and were uh, dominant at that time. That's another story, uh, but sort of interesting. Uh, any other time, the Catholics would want to deny that Babylon equals Rome, but uh, they they want to claim that there because there's nothing in the New Testament that places Peter in Rome. Certainly not until maybe the very end of his life when he was brought there as a prisoner and executed, but he had uh, basically nothing to do with the establishment of the church in Rome, uh, except that there were those who were in Jerusalem on the original day of Pentecost of the New Testament era, uh, who were converted. Uh, there were those from Rome, as well as from any number of other areas, uh, who were there to celebrate Pentecost. And uh, some of those undoubtedly uh, went on back to Rome at a later time and served as sort of a nucleus of, of the group that began to grow up there. Uh, but anyway, we'll get into some of that a little later. Particularly in the first few chapters of the book of Acts, uh, there's a great deal of emphasis on the miracles that God wrought on behalf of the early New Testament church. Um, you know, Christ had talked about in Matthew 21:43, had told the um, Pharisees that the kingdom of God was going to be taken away from them and given to a people bringing forth the fruits thereof. That's recorded in Matthew 21. 43. The establishment of the Old Covenant with ancient Israel was a time period that was surrounded by tremendous miracles, an outpouring of God's miraculous power, making plain uh, that it was the God of heaven who was establishing that covenant. As the New Covenant now began to be established with spiritual Israel, there was an outpouring of miraculous power making it evident where God was working, that a transition was taking place. You know, you have, uh, as the story opens, the miracle of the languages there on Pentecost, recorded in Acts chapter 2, uh, the healing of the lame man sitting in front of the temple in chapter 3, uh, God's punishment of Ananias and Sapphira um, in chapter 5, uh, people being healed by just Peter's shadow passing over them, chapter 5. Angelic deliverance of the apostles from prison there in chapter 5. All of these things, along with others, serve to illustrate the dramatic way in which God was making known to all Jerusalem that this is where he was working. 
this is who it was that exercised that authority, the early New Testament apostles, rather than uh, the scribes and Pharisees and, and those, the uh, Sadducees. The, uh, uh, a dramatic upsurge of public miracles at the beginning of the book, but as you go through the book, by the time you, you go through the, uh, the periods of about uh, three decades that are encompassed in the uh, book of Acts, there has been a gradual fading uh, of this, let's say, the dramatic public miracles. I don't mean that miracles ever totally ceased or that healings ever totally ceased, but you don't find in the latter part of the book of Acts the dramatic outpouring uh, that you did in the beginning. Uh, you know, early on, uh, Peter was sent to was put in prison and, and God sent an angel and delivered him. Uh, the latter part of the book of Acts, Paul was put in prison and stayed there for years transferred from one prison to the next. One other thing we'll see this evening, chapters 8 and 9, give us an introduction to two very important figures in the history of the church. We're introduced to Saul of Tarsus, who went on to become Paul the Apostle, and we're also introduced in chapter 8 to Simon the Sorcerer, known in history as Simon Magus. Uh, and he is a, certainly a very interesting a character in his own uh, in his own right. Now, as we get on into the uh, material in Acts here this evening, we see that, uh, of course, Christ appeared to the disciples over a period of forty days, and uh, they inquired of him, you know, is it time to is, is the kingdom going to be established right now? And he told them, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons. Verse eight but you shall receive power after that the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. And when he had spoken these, these things, while they beheld, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, Behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. Said, You men of Galilee, why stand you gazing up into the heavens? By the way, you know it's possible to take verses out of context. Uh, did you know that this particular verse, uh, you remember the, the uh, ever reading about the story of the conflict between Galileo and the Pope? Um, and, and uh, you know, Galileo's telescope and his discovery that... Uh, what was being taught was, um, you know, in terms of the uh, Earth rotation around the, uh, the Sun and, and uh, things of that sort, quite different than what was the accepted idea of the day. Uh, one of the uh, Catholic cardinals who was uh, a close associate of the Pope wrote a uh, uh, sort of a response to Galileo and uh, uh, condemned the use of telescopes uh, as sinful. And his proof text was Acts 111, which he translated, You men of Gal Galileo, why stand you gazing up into the heavens? Period. Uh, that was as far as he needed to go in the verse. That was, uh, uh, see, even an angel said you weren't supposed to gaze up into the heavens, so that <laughs> answered that. Uh, it does show that verses can be taken out of context. Uh, and uh, that's... Uh, um, that, of course, has nothing to do with what's being said. You know, Christ, uh, Christ ascends up. You can imagine the twelve. They're standing there just gawking and gaping, and they watch, and he just disappears. Eventually, he gets where the clouds uh, cover him, and he's disappeared into the clouds, and, and they can't see him, and they're just standing there staring. Here is this man with whom they had walked and talked for years, spent time with, uh, you know, camped with, eaten meals with, spent countless hours, day in and day out. They had seen him die, then they had seen him alive, and now they stood there and they watched him rise up into the air until he couldn't see him anymore. You can imagine how, what an overwhelming sight. And I think, the, the, you know, the realization is of that, this was real to those men. And when you read the, the, the opening chapters of the book of Acts, 
You read about people who were on fire. This was the most real thing in their life. It wasn't way off somewhere. It wasn't sort of some bedtime story. This transformed their lives. It was the most dramatic, uh, defining period and moment of their lives. This, this time, particularly from the time of the resurrection to the ascension. An angel appeared and said, you know, what are you staring at? He's going to come back just like you've seen him go. So Christ's return is going to be visible, isn't it? They stood and watched him disappear up into the clouds. So he's going to come back in like manner. Didn't say, well, you know, one night just you may be raptured away in your sleep. <laughs> and he didn't tell them that. So they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is about a Sabbath day journey. The only, the only place in the Bible this phrase is used. And uh, nowhere is a Sabbath day journey defined in Scripture. It was a term that uh, was used among the Jews, referring to a, you know, a short distance. They came back. There was a room uh, there where the twelve were um, staying. And they all continued with one accord, verse 14, in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. You know, there was a time earlier in his ministry when his brethren did not believe in him, you remember? And uh, they had seen him after the resurrection. In, in one specific case, it mentions, uh, you know, his appearance to James. You can imagine what a dramatic impact that had on them uh, this was their brother with whom they had grown up. And, uh, you know, the impact of the resurrection. So uh, uh, there were, uh, they continued with one accord in prayer and supplication. This was a period of preparation for power. In God's time, he was going to pour out power. But he was going to pour out power on those who were prepared spiritually to receive it. In those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples, clearly the leader among the twelve. There were, this time, altogether about 120 disciples. And uh, he made reference to the prophecies in the Old Testament uh, concerning Judas and the fact that... Uh, uh, Judas, as he says in verse 17, was numbered with us, had obtained part of this ministry. This man purchased a field with the reward of iniquity and falling headlong burst asunder in the midst. Now, there are some who read this and go back and compare it to Matthew 27 and uh, conclude, well, you know, the Bible contradicts itself. Well, the Bible doesn't contradict itself at all. Uh, it's just that Matthew's account and Luke's account in Acts tell two different parts of the same story. Matthew 27 tells us uh, that in verse 3, Judas, which betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself, brought again the 30 pieces of silver, and said, I've sinned, I've betrayed innocent blood, and they said, what do we care? What's that to us? He threw down the pieces of silver in the temple, departed, and went and hanged himself. Then the chief priest took the silver got into a great debate about what to do with the price of blood. Couldn't put it in the temple treasury. You know, it was amazing. You talk about guys who were who majored in the minors. Uh, the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees could go into great depth and detail arguing about something minor. It's like, you know, in one sense, once you have been involved in, in committing a crime, uh, you know, they recognize this is blood money. We paid someone to betray. You do that, and, and that's not a problem, but, uh-oh, where are we going to put it? You know, can't put it in the temple treasury. Not supposed to put stuff like that in the temple treasury. Uh, so it, it uh, they just had a knack for totally missing the point of what was important, for missing the spirit of the law, the principle of the law. What was God after? So after taking counsel... And you wonder how long it took them to debate this issue and come up with this conclusion. Uh, they decided to buy the potter's field and bury, treasure, bury strangers in it. Now, 
This was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet. Now again, some of the commentators get worked up about this because you don't find this quote in Jeremiah. You find a quote, a similar quote in Zechariah chapter 11. When they say, well, you know, Luke got it wrong. Well, Luke didn't get it wrong. He didn't say this was what was written by Jeremiah the prophet. He said this was what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet. Jeremiah spoke it. Years later, Zechariah recorded it. Uh, but Jeremiah was evidently the one who, you think, only things Jeremiah ever said in his life were, was just what's contained in the book of Jeremiah. Uh, he didn't talk very much. Uh, just, you know, a few words now and then over all the decades that he lived. Well, he undoubtedly spoke many prophecies, and there were things that were remembered verbally. Uh, there are references elsewhere in Scripture to things that had been spoken, and a certain memory of it came down, though it was not contained in the pages of Scripture. So uh, we're told that uh, Judas went and uh, hanged himself, we're told in Matthew 27, 5. Um, Luke tells us in the book of Acts that... Um, he fell headlong and burst asunder in the midst. Well, uh, you know, the answer is you put the two together. He hung himself, committed suicide, hung there for a few days. Uh, the body bloated and began to decompose and uh, broke and, you know, fell down off of this hillside or wherever it was that uh, whatever the exact configuration fell down in this field below, the very, very gruesome end. Uh, the matter that each account just simply mentions different details. Well, Peter makes reference to this, and uh, this was well known to everyone in Jerusalem. He quoted a verse from the Psalms and um, said, you know, we have to select someone else. Now, the selection, they, they did something here that you don't read of occurring later in the New Testament, but they narrowed it down to two, Joseph and Matthias, um, and then they cast lots. One of the things to realize, the selection to fill the ranks of one of the twelve was very significant because when you read, uh, it was not just an office to be filled at that time. Uh, if you read in Revelation 21, you find that the names of the twelve apostles are inscribed on the twelve foundations of the New Jerusalem, just as the names of the tribes of Israel are twelve tribes are record are inscribed over the gates of the New Jerusalem. So the selection was not just for a man who was going to do a job at a specific period in time. In effect, uh, you were selecting one of the twelve names to be inscribed in the foundation of the New Jerusalem. That was not a decision that was to be made on purely a human level. Peter knew that he couldn't fully discern uh, this. It, they sort of narrowed it down the two. Also, the fact that the Holy Spirit had not yet been given. It was with them, as Christ told them in the end of the book of John. It was with them, but it was not yet in them. That wouldn't occur for several more days. And so the, this number of the twelve was a specific number. It was not something that continued over a period of time. You know, when James, the brother of John, was executed in Acts 12, you don't find them getting together and choosing someone to take his place. This is, uh, there were other apostles later. Paul clearly states that he was an apostle. Barnabas was an apostle. Uh, I think James, the brother of Jesus, was clearly an apostle, but they were not members of the twelve. This was a specific category of individuals who were witnesses uh, of Jesus' ministry, including his death and resurrection and ascension into heaven. So uh, this was a specific thing, and God uh, made plain uh, who was chosen. The lot fell on Matthias. He was numbered with the eleven. Verse 26. Now you and I don't know much about Matthias or for that matter uh, you know any number of others uh, but the time's going to come I'm sure when we will. You know they, they played a, a significant role. They were 
uh, hand-selected in a special way. But their role did not was not a uh, was not that prominent in terms of what has been recorded in the permanent record. God chose Luke, who was the traveling companion of Paul, to write the book on the Acts of the Apostles. So what Luke wrote was one background information up until Paul began to travel, and then Luke recorded first-hand information because he traveled with Paul during much of his many of his journeys. And uh, God worked that out. Uh, Acts chapter 2 continues the uh, uh, story here. The day of Pentecost was fully come. They were all with one accord in one place. Suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. It filled the house where they were sitting. So they were sitting in the house. They were not uh, uh, having a, quote, Terry meeting, as the uh, Pentecostals uh, say. It, it, uh, this came suddenly. It was God's time. It was not that people had been worked up into an emotional frenzy and started jumping and hooping and hollering and, you know, repeating back phrases and, and, and sort of getting worked up until one of them fell over, quote, slain in the spirit, uh, like some of these modern Pentecostal meetings. If you read this, it was nothing at all like some of those things. What those people try to do is to work up through emotion a duplication of the events that occurred back at this time. Well, there appeared cloven tongues like as of fire. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other languages as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. When this was noised about, multitude came together and they were amazed because you see they heard them speaking in their own language and they said well these men are all from Galilee and it mentions you had Parthians Medes Elamites uh, dwellers in Mesopotamia and in Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus Asia Phrygia Pamphylia Egypt parts of Libya Cyrenia uh, strangers of Rome Jews and proselytes Cretes and Arabians so you had a very wide representation. People spoke all these local languages and dialects. And God poured out this miracle, and there were those there who testified. They didn't hear them just sort of rattling off some meaningless phrase. They heard them speaking, and they heard them speaking the wonderful words, the wonderful words of God. Uh, wonderful God's wonderful works mentioned here in verse 11. They heard a meaningful message, a message that changed and transformed the lives of thousands who heard it that day. Well, they didn't understand, you know, uh, the, the initially as, as they heard this, and of course some were mocking because maybe they were standing over in an area. I think the, the indication is that uh, the apostles perhaps uh, spoke in different languages. You know, they didn't have a microphone or a PA system set up, and uh, uh, they were around. They weren't all speaking at the same time, but uh, uh, undoubtedly, whichever one was speaking a particular language collected a crowd around him of people who understood that language. And, uh, you know, if they were standing, let's say, facing out toward a crowd, sort of with their, let's, sort of in a, in a big circle with their um, backs sort of to one another, um, that sort of configuration, then each of them is projecting out toward a particular group. They're not all projecting in on, on somebody. They were projecting out, and uh, there, were, there was a message that, that was being said where we have Peter quoted, and uh, we have what he said that is recorded. Though the indication is that certainly um, there were many others of them uh, who spoke. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit. I would take it that all of the twelve uh, spoke at some point. Uh, perhaps others did as well, but particularly the twelve. Uh, they were the sort of the center of this, and Peter, as their leader, was the one that uh, was used. Peter quotes these scriptures from Joel, and uh, then makes it 
plain that Jesus of Nazareth, verse 22, uh, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as you yourselves also know. And he went through and talked about how he was slain, how he was raised from the dead, quotes the prophecies of David, and uh, and finally said, uh, uh, you know, they responded to that. Men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter told them to repent and be baptized. Notice, by the way, that Peter's message had nothing to do with uh, when we all get to heaven. Uh, he said in verse 29, Men and brethren, let me freely speak to you of the patriarch David. He's de both dead and buried. His sepulchre is with us to this day. Being a prophet, knowing that God had sworn with uh, an oath to him that of the fruits of his loins, fruit of his loins according to the flesh, he would raise up the Messiah. So he said, he quotes the, the verse from the Psalms. And um, then in verse 34, he says, David is not ascended into the heaven. He himself says, the Lord said unto my Lord, sit on your right hand till I make your foes your footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made the same Jesus whom you've crucified, both Lord and Christ. Both Lord, ruler, and Messiah. Now, Peter certainly shows here that, uh, you know, they all understood David was dead and buried. David was not in heaven. Uh, if David wasn't in heaven, then who, pray tell, was? Remember, this is after the ascension into heaven. Even for the uh, the Catholics that want to stick uh, the Old Testament, quote, saints uh, in limbus patrum uh, and, and stick them down there for a period of time, even they uh, conclude that that came to an end at Christ's ascension into heaven. But Acts 2 makes very plain that, that nobody had ascended up to heaven except Christ. So Peter told them to repent and to be baptized. Uh, now, those are the conditions that God requires to receive the Holy Spirit. But you have to understand what repentance is. Uh, re you know, faith and repentance are the prerequisites for baptism and the receiving of the Spirit. They believed what Peter said. And so they responded in faith by saying, what shall we do? So... You have to believe the message. You'll never repent if you don't believe it. Why would you turn your life around for something you don't believe? The kind of belief that he's talking about is not an academic belief. Oh, yes, I believe in Jesus. Well, so does the devil. We're talking here about a belief that produces actions. If I really believe something, then I will act accordingly. And that's what Peter told them to do. He told them the appropriate response to that belief was repentance, turning around going the other way, and to be baptized, and they would receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Verse 40, with many other words did he testify and exhort. So we just have a very brief synopsis of Peter's message. Those that gladly received the word were baptized. There were about 3,000 souls baptized that day. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and uh, th they continued steadfastly with one accord in the temple uh, they continued steadfastly in the apostles doctrine fellowship breaking of bread and prayer so they continued to learn even after they were baptized there was a lot of things left to learn but they had an attitude of willingness uh, they spent time together in fellowship and breaking of bread they spent time in prayer with god they fellowship with God, and they fellowship with one another. And great fear came upon every soul. Many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. Those who believed had, were together, and they had all things in common. Understand, many of these people had flocked into Jerusalem for the festival season. They were from a variety of other places. When all of this happened, nobody wanted to go back home. They wanted to stay right there. And those who lived there didn't want them to go back home either. They said, well, that's okay. You can just move in with me. They, all of this, this you could just almost sense the electricity that was running through.
these tremendous events happening day by day. Nobody wanted to go back home. You want to catch the first boat out and go back to Rome when, when all of this is going on right there? So people started liquidating property and just donating. And uh, the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. It uh, wasn't that, uh, you know, that's the key. God has to add. God has to put someone there. Well, Peter and John went up to the temple to pray. This is the account of the lame man who was lying there at one of the gates of the temple asking alms. And uh, Peter uh, and John came there, and Peter said, Peter and John looked at him, and Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And immediately the man did. Well, he stood up and walked and entered in with them to the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. Can you imagine? He'd never been able to stand on his feet in his life. He was jumping up in the air. He was uh, so excited. Uh, just, uh, you know, incredible. Well, this fellow had been a regular fixture at that gate for years, and people recognized him. And there was not all that long, there was quite a group of people gathered around. When Peter had this audience, uh, he began to speak to them. And he said, you know, why do you marvel at this? As though by our own power or holiness we made this man to walk. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his son Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate. You denied the Holy One and desired a murderer. You killed the Prince of Life. So he told them to repent, verse 19 and uh, went through and preached this powerful sermon. Well, ver chapter 4, the priests and the captains of the temple and the Sadducees uh, came, and they were grieved that he taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection of the dead. Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection. That, that bothered them. So they laid hands on them and put them in jail. It was now getting on evening, and uh, um, they were going to put them in jail and hold them for the next day. Well... A lot of those that heard the word believed, and there were about 5,000 men. Well, the next day, they brought them into the assembly here before the Sanhedrin and said, verse 7, by what power or what name have you done this? Where did you get the authority to do all of this? And Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said, you rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if you're examining us concerning the good deed done to the infinite man, and you want to know by what means he's made whole, then I'll tell you, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God has raised from the dead, even by him does this man stand before you whole. This is the stone set at naught of you builders. Become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other. There's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. There's only one way to salvation. Boy, you know, that makes people mad. Made them mad then. Makes them mad today. Oh, you mean all these good Buddhists aren't saved and all these people? Why, you know, there's one way. And there's only one way. And and that's it. And Peter didn't, didn't pull any punches on that. And, uh, you know, here's the man. He's standing right there. What are they going to say? Sort of hard to argue. Everybody had a little... Uh, conference there among themselves, and they said, "Well, look, we, uh, you know, we got to put a stop to this. So let's let's threaten." Them. Oh, boy, that was really going to accomplish a lot, wasn't it? I mean, it's you, you talk about totally missing the point. Uh, they thought that, well, you know, you better not do that again. They could sort of intimidate. Them. Well, here were Peter and John answered them, verse nineteen and said, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, you judge. We cannot but speak the things which we've seen and heard. And so uh, um, they further threatened them. They let them go. They couldn't find any excuse to punish them. The man was over 40 years old on whom the miracle of healing was showed. So they praised God and were very, very thankful. Uh, and... Uh, um, they said in verse 29, Lord, behold, their threatenings grant unto your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching forth your hand to heal. Uh, 
signs and wonders might be done in the name of your uh, holy child or holy son, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit, spoke the Word of God with boldness. There was a confidence. Where did they go to get that confidence? They just sort of work it up in themselves? No, they went to God. They were close to God. They were thankful for the privilege of doing God's work. And even when they were persecuted, they were thankful that they were accounted worthy to do that. And just ask God to give them boldness, give them courage. And he gave it to them. They were all one heart and one, one mind. People were giving. And uh, they were donating property. And there was great power poured out. Everybody was provided for. And we find in verse 36 that there was a man by the name of Joseph, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, which is being interpreted the son of consolation or the son of encouragement. He was a Levite from Cyprus, and he had land and sold it, brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. This is the first place we read of Barnabas, and we find he plays a major role as we go on through a portion of the remainder of the book of Acts. It's sort of interesting, you know, Barnabas wasn't his real name. You know, do you ever think of Joseph the Cypriot? Uh, you, you know, if I were to ask the question or to have asked it at the beginning of the Bible study, how many of you are familiar with uh, Joseph the Cypriot? Well, you know, we, we never think of him that way. This was a nickname. He was evidently a man who, who had a gift for encouragement. He was a, a very uh, encouraging and positive person. And the apostles gave him a nickname. It meant son of encouragement. God gives different people different different gifts. As by I'm sure by personality and, and temperament, he tended a certain way, and and God used him that way and used him to help and encourage many people. And uh, that's the name by which we all know him. That's that's what he went by. Um, so he's introduced here. Then that's contrasted with Ananias and Sapphira. Now let's notice a couple of things. One, what the apostles were doing, what the early New Testament church was doing, they were not practicing communism. They were not requiring, not saying everything belongs to the community. No, Ananias and Sapphira sold a possession, kept back part of the price. They were had worked this up among themselves, brought a part of it, laid it at the apostles' feet. You know, and they were clearly telling the apostles, this is all we could get. You know, we've donated everything we had. They were lying. That was the problem. Notice what Peter told them in verse 4. He said, look, you know, verse 3 says, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to keep back part of the price of the land? While it remained, wasn't it your own? After it was sold, it was in your own power. You know, it was your property. Nobody, We didn't make you sell it. We didn't tell you you had to sell it. It was yours. You could have kept it. After you kept it, the money was yours. But you have come and have tried to misrepresent things. You have not lied to men. You've lied to God. Ananias was struck dead and hauled away. A little while later, Sapphira came, and Peter said, uh, Hey, uh, what did you sell the land for? Did you sell it for such and such? She says, yes, that's right. That's all we could get. And Peter said, well, how is it you and your husband agreed together to tempt the Holy Spirit? The feet of them that have buried your husband are at the door, and they'll carry you out. And she fell down and died, was carried out. Great fear came upon all the church, verse 11. You better believe that word of that story spread like wildfire. Uh, would you want to be the next guy to go up to Peter and sort of shade the truth a little bit? Um Great fear came upon all the church. By the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people. And um, it got to the point, verse 15, they were bringing the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and couches that at the least the shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow some of them. And uh, they came and brought sick people and those vexed with unclean spirits and they were healed every one. And the high priest and the other Sadducees rose up, and they were filled with indignation. They threw the apostles in jail. The angel of the Lord showed up that night and opened the prison doors and brought them forth. 
said, go speak, stand and speak in the temple. And so they did. They entered the temple early in the morning and taught. High priest came, you know. He would uh, sort of had his, uh, uh, he was ready to get down to business, called the council together, sent somebody over to the prison to bring the prisoners. The officers came back and said, uh, don't quite know how to tell you this, but you know, the prison is empty. I mean, of the, the, these men aren't there. Uh, their cell is empty. You know, everything's locked up just like we left it. The guards are still in place. But when we uh, open the door, nobody's standing in there. And so they heard this. They were, uh, you know, trying to figure out. They doubted in themselves what this thing was going to come to. And about that time, somebody came in and said, uh, you know those guys we threw in jail last night? They're in the temple preaching. And they got quite a crowd. Well, they came and they brought them without violence. They were scared of the people. And the priest said, verse 28, Did not we straightly command you that you should not teach in this name? You fill Jerusalem with your doctrine. You intend to bring this man's blood on us. Peter said, We ought to obey God rather than men. You know, that's pretty clear cut. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you slew and hanged on a tree. Well, that's pretty blunt. Uh, you killed him and God raised him up. And uh, we're witnesses of these things. So also is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to them that obey him. Oh, who does God give his spirit to? To those that obey him. You see, real repentance produces a change of life. Conversion it involves obedience. It's not that you earn your salvation. But if you really believe God and you have truly repented of your sins, then you turn away from sin. You don't want to live that way anymore. God gives his spirit to those that obey him. Those that doesn't mean that, that um, you're perfect or that you never make a mistake. It means that you have surrendered and you want him to rule your life. Well, they were really sort of cut to the heart on these things, and they took counsel to slay them. They, they were plotting and murmuring, and, and uh, Gamaliel, one of the Pharisees, uh, who was a man of note, uh, he referred to later in the New Testament, we find that he had been the teacher uh, of uh, the, uh, the Apostle Paul back uh, in his young years. And uh, Gamaliel reminded them of incidents that had happened in the past, of would-be messiahs and they told he told them he said look if it's of god you're not going to be able to stop it if it's of men it's not going to come to anything if it's of god you can't stop it and you better be careful about fighting against it unless fighting against it we'd be found to be fighting against god so they they had to agree with that um but they uh, had to had them beaten anyway then commanded them that they should not speak in the name of jesus and let them go and notice the apostles' attitude. They departed from the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And daily in the temple and in every house they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. Didn't slow them down a minute. Now the number of the, mul of the uh, disciples multiplied and there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected. Uh, this would refer to the, uh, let's say, the Hellenized Jews or the Greek-speaking Jews uh, who uh, had, uh, you know, either stayed behind after Pentecost or in some cases had uh, uh, others from the, uh, the Greek-speaking areas that had moved to Jerusalem. We know from history that there were Greek-speaking synagogues uh, in Jerusalem that catered to the uh, Hellenized Jews, just as there were uh, Aramaic-speaking synagogues that, that catered to the, uh, the, the, those from Judea. Well, there was there arose some complaining, and it seems like inevitably, you know, time goes by. Sooner or later, something begins to happen. I, I think the I think it's important to notice how the apostles responded. The first thing they did was they listened, they paid attention, and they called the multitude together. I, I would take it that these were, let's say, some of the spokesmen or the leading ones. 
because uh, there were by this time thousands upon thousands uh, there in Jerusalem. The disciples called them together, the, evidently some of the chief ones who had voiced complaints. And the next thing they did was they set the parameters of the decision. They said, now, that you know, you got a problem. We acknowledge that there must be a problem. How are we going to solve it? Well, one thing we could do is we could tend to everything ourselves. That's not going to work. We've got other job, other responsibilities. We, we can't leave what we have to do and simply wait on tables because we've been given another responsibility. So here's what we need. We will take set, we'll appoint seven men. We want seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Spirit and of wisdom, whom we may appoint over this. You look out from among you. Bring us back a list of seven names. Here's the qualifications. Here's These men must be noted for uh, wisdom, for honesty, and for being truly converted. We, on the other hand, are going to continue doing what we're supposed to do. So everybody was happy with that. And they got together, talked it over, came back with seven names uh, whom they set before the apostles. And when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. So they ordained them, set them apart. They, the, the apostles reserved the final decision to themselves. Uh, they prayed about it, sought God's approval and blessing, and God led them that this, these were the ones. I think it's interesting to see what they didn't do. They did not dismiss the complaints out of hand and refuse to listen. They did not try to micromanage and, and do every uh, detail of it themselves. They, they listened. They set guidelines and parameters. They delegated authority and then reserved final judgment. There is a lot that all of us can learn about leadership and how to handle problems in any situation that come up. You can take, apply it in the church, you can apply it in the family, you can apply it in business. Uh, some very important principles uh, that come out here. Well, the Word of God increased. The number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. Uh, a great number of the priests were obedient to the faith. So things were spreading. Stephen who was full of faith and of power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. You know, God empowered him to do that. And uh, uh, he was evidently, uh, there was a call here, uh, this uh, synagogue called the Synagogue of the Libertines. And some of the commentaries will dispute as to whether this was one or two or more synagogues. But uh, the Libertines were the free men. And this, these were uh, evidently uh, Jews from the diaspora, uh, Jews and proselytes uh, uh, who had been formerly slave but were now free. And there were, you know, many synagogues there in Jerusalem. Stephen had been preaching there, and they had not been able to resist his wisdom. And uh, eventually, they hired false witnesses to give a false testimony. And their testimony was, we've heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. Now, let me just call your attention to something. If the apostles had been preaching Protestant theology, would you have had to hire false witnesses to say Stephen preached things against Moses? If the apostles had been going around saying that you don't have to keep the Sabbath, that the law was nailed to the cross, that uh, all these things were done away. You know, if the 12 apostles had been preaching what Joe Jr. and his crowd came up with, nobody would have had to hire a false witness to say we heard them say bad things about Moses. Clearly, there was nothing they had said against Moses any more than there was that they had sent against God. They hired false witnesses. They bribed them to tell a lie because they didn't have anything true that they could build a case on. You know, some of these things are, are, are fairly simple. People sometimes want to argue about some technical verse, and they don't look at just the story. And, and you understand the technical verses in the context of everything else that was said. You know, Mr. Armstrong used to emphasize on more than one occasion, you do not build an entire doctrine 
on some obscure or difficult to understand verse. You don't uh, pick out something, uh, you men of Galilee, why stand gazing into the heavens, uh, stop there and all of a sudden build a whole teaching on, on something like that. That's silly. And I think this is, is uh, um, something. So uh, the, um, these false witnesses said, this man ceases not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. We've heard him say that Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs which Moses delivered us. These weren't true witnesses. These were false witnesses. So if a false witness said that, then what would a true witness have said? He would have said the very opposite. And the high priest said, Is this so? And Stephen then began back at the beginning and said, The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia. Uh, and then he begins to go through the story and how God dealt with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph, brought them into the promised land under Joshua, and uh, tells the story of Moses. And uh, then he says in verse 37, This is that Moses which said unto the children of Israel, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. So he quotes this prophecy from back in, uh, uh, back in Deuteronomy 18. And uh, talks about how our, the, the ancestors had turned back to Egypt in their hearts. Uh, verse uh, 39. How God brought them on in, finally. Um, talks about uh, uh, David. Uh, as king and Solomon building the temple. And then uh, uh, he told them in verse 51, You stiff-necked and uncircumcised and heart and ears, you do always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did. He says, you know, you go through the story and over and over again, you haven't listened. Which of the prophets didn't your fathers persecute? You received the law by the disposition of angels and you haven't kept it. You're trying to accuse me of teaching that it's done away? You're the ones that haven't kept it. You haven't kept it. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. Oh, that made them furious. And he, being full of the Holy Spirit, looking up steadfastly into heaven, he saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens open, the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. They cried with a loud voice, stopped their ears, and ran on him with one accord, threw him out of the city, stoned him. And Stephen is he was being stoned, called upon God, and he said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Knelt down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. Then he simply went to sleep and died. He did not die in a bitter, resentful attitude, but an attitude of love and forgiveness. He, he in his death, evidenced the same kind of attitude that Jesus himself evidenced when he died. Stephen was filled with the Holy Spirit. God's attitude, God's mind was reflected in him. Now in chapter 8, we're introduced to Saul, a young man standing there consenting to his death. And uh, Stephen was buried. Saul made havoc of the church. He entered into every house, and he was arresting people and having them thrown into prison. And they were scattered abroad everywhere, preaching the word. You know, it's interesting, even Satan's attacks and persecution serve a positive purpose. God established the nucleus of the church. Several years had passed, where uh, at least a couple of years by this time, that uh, uh, there was a, a stability, there was, uh, there was something that was built up there in, a, in the Christian community. Now it was time for things to begin to spread. And so persecution came, and uh, people left Jerusalem. And uh, uh, Philip, who was one of those that had been ordained with Stephen, went down to Samaria, and he preached Christ there. And uh, people gave heed. They saw the miracles that he did. There were demons cast out and sicknesses healed. And great joy. There was a certain man called Simon which before time in the same city used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that he himself was some great one, to whom they all gave heed, saying, This man is the great power of God. He used sorcery. 
So this is the man, Simon the sorcerer, Simon Magus, uh, as he is known, was the religious leader viewed as the great power of God. He was um, the one who was the most uh, greatly looked to by the Samaritans. The Samaritans, on the one hand, claimed a connection with the Jews. The Samaritans practiced circumcision. The Samaritans uh, acknowledged the Torah, though they had their own version that differed in uh, certain strategic points. Um, the Samaritans had a put a twist on things. You can go back to the Old Testament to read the, uh, the story. Uh, the Samaritans, one of the things we're going to see as we go through, uh, on through the book of Acts, initially the uh, church was entirely, uh, was entirely Jewish, and that, was the, that is the story on up through Acts chapter 9. Uh, entirely Jewish in the sense of only those who were circumcised had been baptized. You see, that certainly was not a problem among the Jews. It wasn't even a problem in Samaria because the Samaritans were circumcised. And if they would, the Jews would allow the Samaritans to come in if the, if the, if the Samaritans would acknowledge that the Jews were right, uh, you know, in terms of the Scripture. The, the Samaritans were sort of viewed as about half, you know, halfway between Jews and, and Gentiles. Uh, well, there were many baptisms, and Simon himself was baptized. Verse 13. He was really impressed. He saw Philip doing all these things that he couldn't duplicate. And he couldn't figure out how Philip did it. He wanted the secret. Well, a little later, Peter and John heard about what was going on, and they came uh, from Jerusalem to Samaria. And uh, they laid hands on and prayed for the Samaritans. That they received the Holy Spirit and laid hands on them, and they did. When Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hand the Holy Spirit was given, he offered the money. He wanted to buy an apostleship. He wanted to buy the power to do what they could do. Peter recognized the problem. He said, your money perish with you because you have thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. You have neither part nor lot in this matter. Your heart is not right in the sight of God. He says, you better repent of your wickedness. Verse 23 I perceive that you're in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. So this religious leader of the Samaritans was not just some ordinary fellow. Uh, he hadn't just made a little mistake. Peter said, you're in the gall of bitterness. You're in the bond of iniquity. He was bound up in lawlessness, became actually the leader uh, and the fountainhead of, of what developed into the false church. Now, Peter makes an interesting statement here. He said, you have neither part nor lot in this matter. Now, that's an interesting phrase because the only other place you see reference to this is in the book of, in the book of Acts chapter 1 where it talks about uh, uh, Judas, verse 20, uh, ver, uh, Acts one seventeen. he was numbered with us and had obtained part of this ministry. So it comes on down. Um, they appointed Matthias and uh, Joseph uh, Barsabbas, and they cast lots. Uh, they cast a lot in verse 25 that he may take part of this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell. And they gave forth their lots, and the lot fell upon Matthias. The... Uh, part of the ministry chosen by Lot. That referred to being one of the twelve. Peter says, you have neither part nor Lot. It was a reference to the fact that Simon wanted the office that they held. And they recognized what was going on. Well, they testified and preached the word of the Lord and returned to Jerusalem. Uh, in the meantime, Philip was told to go south, uh, going down toward Jerusalem under Gaza. And uh, while there, he met an man of Ethiopia, a eunuch who had great authority, uh, who was the treasurer. And he had come to Jerusalem to worship. He was returning to Ethiopia, sitting in his chariot, reading the Isaiah the prophet. Now again, realize that uh, there are some who have wondered, well, uh, 
was this man really an Ethiopian? Well, uh, very likely. Uh, no reason he couldn't have been. The uh, uh, the leading class, the the uh, the leading uh, element of of the Ethiopians practiced uh, Judaism. They practiced circumcision. They acknowledged the the Torah. Um, you know, the, if you remember uh, Haile Selassie, who Mr. Armstrong knew, the last emperor of Ethiopia, he claimed and igno- he, he claimed to be a uh, direct uh, descendant of Solomon and the Queen of Sheba. And uh, uh, in fact, his title, he called himself the Lion of the Tribe of Judah. The point is that uh, you realize that uh, when uh, Catholic missionaries uh, came to uh, Ethiopia, uh, back in the uh, 1600s, uh, that uh, they were uh, observing Sabbath rather than Sunday. Uh, you know, it's interesting. They, they they had not totally preserved the truth, but they had not. Uh, uh, th- there was a lot of uh, things that had been preserved, and, and circumcision was one of it, and is practiced to this day. Um, this was clearly this man would not have been regarded as a Gentile. Uh, he was undoubtedly circumcised. He had come up to Jerusalem to worship, come up to the temple. He was familiar with the scriptures. He was, re- he was reading the book of Isaiah. So here was a man that knew the law of God. He was familiar with the scriptures. He had come up to Jerusalem to worship. He acknowledged uh, that that's where the truth was. Uh, so Philip encountered him and asked him if he understood what he read. And he said, well, how can I except some man should guide me? What a remarkable attitude of humility. Here was a man of great power and position, uh, held a very high office uh, in uh, the the, uh, kingdom of Ethiopia. Uh, He was an educated man, and yet he acknowledged that he needed help to understand the truth. Uh, You know, we've got a lot of people today who certainly don't have the attitude of the Ethiopian eunuch. If there's one thing they think, it's that they don't need any man to tell them anything. And so they've gone off in a hundred different directions. Uh, It's an interesting attitude. You see, it was an attitude that lent itself to conversion. He had a humble, teachable attitude. Philip didn't have to go through which day is the Christian Sabbath and pagan holidays or God's holy days or any of these things. This man was already familiar with those things. There was one issue that he needed to understand, and that was that all the prophecies of the Old Testament that pointed toward the Messiah, that that the Messiah had already come, Jesus of Nazareth. And uh, so um, Philip explained that, the man was baptized. Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples, chapter 9, verse 1, went to the high priest, got letters uh, allowing him to go to Damascus, to the synagogues, so he could start binding people and bringing them to Jerusalem. Well, on his way... As he came near Damascus, a light shined, and he was struck down, blinded, and he heard this voice, Saul, Saul, why do you uh, persecute me? And uh, he said, who are you? And he said, I'm Jesus, whom you persecute. It's hard for you to kick against the pricks. He, trembling and astonished, said, what will you have me do? He was told, go into the city and wait, and uh, you'll find out. So he arose and went in. Um, he was blind. And three day, he fasted for three days. And uh, here toward the end of that, uh, a certain disciple in Damascus by the name of Ananias, the Lord came to him in a vision and said, uh, I want you to go over to uh, the street called Straight to the house of Judas, uh, and I want you to ask for Saul of Tarsus. He's praying right now. And he's seen a vision, and he, you know, I've already sent him a vision that you're coming, and I want you to go in and lay hands on him so he can receive his sight. And Ananias, you know, he, uh, wait a minute, Lord, are we talking about the same fella? Uh, you know, I've heard a lot of bad things about this man, and he came down here with authority to put all the brethren in jail. You, uh, you sure we shouldn't just leave him blind? And the Lord said, go your way. He's a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. So Paul had a threefold commission to bear God's name 
the name of Christ before the Gentiles and before kings and the children of Israel. So Paul's ministry started out in the Gentile areas. Uh, the book of Acts covers the first two phases. Paul's ministry in the Gentile areas and him being brought before kings and rulers. The third part, the children, his ministry to the children of Israel is not covered here. See, those are the last few years of Paul's life that drop from view at the end of the book of Acts, which undoubtedly were, were for the same reasons that the rest of the twelve drop from view. So, anyway, Ananias went his way and uh, he talked with him and and laid hands on him, prayed for him, and uh, he was baptized, and they had a meal. And uh, Saul uh, was certain days there with the disciples in Damascus, went immediately preached Christ in the synagogues, and people who heard him were amazed. They said, well, this is the fellow that uh, came here to throw those folks in jail. And uh, after a while, uh, they were, the Jews wanted to kill him. And... Um, the disciples, verse 25, let him down by the wall, over the wall by night in a basket. He came to Jerusalem, wanted to join himself with the disciples. They were all afraid of him. They didn't really think he, you know, they were suspicious. This was, they, they didn't believe he was really a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostle. You know, it's interesting. This is the, the next place where you read about Barnabas. Uh, you know, can you imagine how discouraging that must have been for Saul? He was all excited just been converted, you know, he was all excited and his whole life had turned around. He came to Jerusalem and he was all excited. He really wanted to jump in the midst of things. Nobody wanted to have anything to do with it. And we don't know exactly how long it went on, but Barnabas came along. He could clearly see maybe that Saul was, get, uh, Saul was getting discouraged. And so he encouraged him and said, here, come on, let me introduce you to the apostle. And he talked to him, visited with him, and sort of got the story and brought him to the apostles and told him what it, told him what had happened. But even then, they, they uh, uh, after a little while in Jerusalem, they sent him on back, verse 30, uh, they brought him to Caesarea, that was the port, and sent him forth to Tarsus. In effect, the apostles told him, uh, tell you what, don't call us, we'll call you. Uh, you know, we're really glad you're converted and you want to be in the work. Uh, I think maybe the best thing for you would probably be to go on back back to where you came from right now. And, you know, if something comes up, well, we'll, 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 we'll let you know. So all the churches, if you put the story together, several years went by. You know, he was tested and proven and did not just start out and sort of launch his own independent ministry. That isn't the way God operates. Later on, several years later, after the door had been opened through Peter to the Gentiles, and a church was raised up in Antioch, Barnabas, who was put there, sent to Antioch by the apostles, Barnabas went up to Tarsus, found him, brought him down to Antioch, and finally began to bring him, work him into the ministry. Several years went by. You know, he had to be tested and proven. And that, that is the case. We find that... Uh, the, the churches had rest throughout Judea and Galilee and Samaria. They were edified. The things continued to grow. Uh, Peter mentions one account. Uh, he'd come down to visit some of the brethren in Lydda, in Lydda and uh, there was uh, a man who was sick of palsy, and, and uh, he was healed. Uh, then there was in Joppa a certain disciple named Tabitha, and she was a fine woman she got sick and died and when they heard Peter was nearby they sent for him and uh, he came very quickly and they were of course upset this woman uh, uh, that they all loved and respected had died and and uh, Peter came in and prayed for her and she was raised up and verse 42 it was known throughout all Joppa and many believed in the Lord and he tarried many days in Joppa with one Simon of Tanner which brings us up to where we will start next time. You know, one of the things, by the way, as you see, uh, some, of course, don't think that the Old Testament is a guide to salvation. What did Philip, what, what scripture did Philip turn to to preach to the Ethiopian eunuch? Did he turn to John 3.16? No. That hadn't been, you know, it would be decades before that had even been written. He turned to Isaiah 53. You go back through the first eight chapters of the book of Acts and you find over and over scriptures being quoted. 
you know, these were scriptures from what we call the Old Testament. Well, anyway, um, we uh, have gotten an overview here of these beginning chapters, and with that we will uh, be concluded here this evening.